This is episode 382 of the Rio Grande Foundation's Tipping Point New Mexico. I'm Paul Guessing, president of the Rio Grande Foundation, New Mexico's free market think tank. You can find out more about the foundation at riograndefoundation.org. I am very pleased to be joined this week by John Block. He is the proprietor and uh, reporter behind the Pinion Post, which is a political blog and news site dealing with New Mexico politics. Welcome to Tipping Point New Mexico, John. Great. Thank you so much for having me, Paul. I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, uh, you've been at it for how many years now with the Pinion Post? Oh, I well, the Pinion Post started in 2020, but uh, I started in 2016 reporting on New Mexico news. So it's been quite a while, but we're looking forward to what we're doing in the state. So yeah, yeah, no, you've been uh, definitely uh, a powerful voice and uh, somebody who uh, does a lot of great work to kind of report on and also advocate for uh, conservative causes in, in the state of New Mexico. And uh, we need more voices like that to be sure. Now, uh, you're, a, you're a pretty young guy uh, and you've uh, obviously grown up in New Mexico and uh, you know, been engaged in New Mexico politics. Uh, give us a little bit about the, uh, the backstory for John Block. And I'll say this first and foremost, uh, I'm sure you get this question every single time, but John Block is no relation to Jay Block who is running for governor, right? Right, yeah, we're not related, but you know, he's a good guy. He always fights for liberty. So, you know, uh, it, it's how it is. But if people think of me as his cousin or whatever, that's fine too. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So well, how, uh, how'd you get involved? Yeah. So I guess from a young age, I started just uh, in school. I always heard in college, you know, people were saying things like I didn't really agree with. And I always heard the climate change was the big issue that really turned me on to the conservative cause because they always talked about, oh, let's save the planet, let's save the planet. But then we always hear all kinds of conflicting information. So that's really where I started. And early on, I just kept on getting involved in local politics. I volunteered for campaigns uh, locally and statewide. I worked hard to really get the conservative message out there. And through that, I just kept on going with what I was doing in the political sphere. Uh, I volunteered on President Trump's 2015 and 2016 campaign. And that really got me fired up to keep on going, fighting for freedom. And so I, I worked for a bunch of different groups. I worked for a pro-life group called Americans United for Life. I worked for a group called the Committee to Defend the President during the 2020 election cycle. And just through that, these different experiences I had working in the political sphere, that's what brought me to really fight for those issues that New Mexico cares about. Because we see every single day, these radical left-wing extremists, they keep on working hard to take away our freedoms here in New Mexico. And I thought that New Mexico didn't really have a news site or a, a news arm to get our voice out, at least online. So what I did was I started, I started a blog. It was called the New Mexico Politics with John Block. And there we just worked hard to get information out about what was happening in the state, for years and years, and that finally turned in 2020 into the Pinion Post, which is now the flagship number one conservative online news site in New Mexico, where we deliver daily constant news coverage of what's happening and those stories that you don't usually find on the mainstream media because they don't usually help the liberal media's bent. So we're the ones that look and uncover and do the research to get those stories and those voices out in New Mexico conservative politics. And I think it really has made a big difference. I think we've really helped kill a lot of very bad bills, such as at the last legislative session, years before that too. And we just keep on fighting, bringing conservative voices. And we always welcome new opinions. We always are willing to post op-eds, even if we disagree with them. We wanna make sure that we get people's voices out there because we're not just some propaganda arm. We're here to have an actual, a good conversation and meaningful conversation to bring the conversation back to New Mexico and what we can do for the people of our state to make it a better state to live in. Now, uh, you currently reside in Alamogordo. Is that the general area where you also grew up in? Yes. Well, uh, in Alamogordo, I moved here a while ago, but I grew up in Santa Fe, liberal communist oh. Santa Fe. So that's where I had to actually fight the libs and learning 
you know, how to, how to differentiate myself from that. So I think it was a good experience. There's a lot of good people still up there, but I'm definitely happy to be in conservative America's country, God's country, uh, Alamogordo. All right. Well, uh, Alamogordo is not too far away where, from where the uh, major events of this past weekend took place in New Mexico, uh, especially Republican politics. But I think it's safe to say that uh, the biggest events going on in New Mexico politics, it's where the Capitol reporters and uh, the folks uh, who really cover this uh, stuff for a living uh, were, which is Rio Doso. And uh, that's where the Republican pre-primary convention was held. Uh, certainly, and we definitely want to talk about this, uh, Republicans are optimistic about the coming November elections uh, between Governor Lujan Grisham and uh, Biden and the policies that they've imposed and their relative lack of popularity. I think we have a great chance to move New Mexico, if nothing else, back towards the center. But uh, it's definitely a fortuitous time to talk to you because you were down in, you were in Riadoso, correct? I was, yes. And, uh, you know, talk a little bit about, well, let's, let's talk before we get into the ins and outs of what happened. Talk about the importance such as it is of this event and uh, what, you know, what's kind of happening at these these types of functions. And is do you know, is this the same process that the Democrats used or is this something the Republican Party itself uh, has decided on in, in the, the way they want to handle things? Uh, to the extent that you know how this all works, tell us, tell us about the process. Yes, so uh, it's very similar to what the Democrats are doing. They have a primary that's actually this weekend that's in Roswell. And ours in Rio Doso, we just met to make sure that we find the strongest candidates to get on the ballot for the June 7th primary. And at the convention, we heard speeches from all those statewide candidates and congressional candidates who were vying for spots on the ballot. And we saw different people take different approaches. And it was a good opportunity for the delegates that were elected by the people of each county to go to the state convention for the party, the Republican party, and choose the strongest candidates they believed to go on the primary ballot. And that means get a 20% vote share of all the votes that were cast. And the people that made 20% automatically get on the ballot. Uh, now the ones that did not meet that 20% threshold, they can get double the signatures required by the state, which I believe is 3%. So that doubled would be 6% and they can go get those signatures. So this event I think is very important because it does bring all those voices together to find the strongest candidate and the most qualified candidate and the candidate that has the most support party unity behind them. And that usually means money as well. And we saw three candidates come out victorious. Number one uh, with Jay Block, he got 199 votes. And then after him was Rebecca Dow. I believe she got seven votes shy of, of J Block. And then right after her was uh, Brigadier General Greg Zanetti. And I think all these three candidates, they do seem to have a lot of following behind them. And so they will all be very strong candidates. And then uh, ex-TV weatherman Mark Ronchetti, he did not meet that 20%, but he says that he has enough signatures to get him on the ballot. So I believe all those four candidates will be there, but it's not... I'm not sure if the last candidate, Ethel Maharg, who is a pro-life leader here in New Mexico, I'm not sure if she's going to go get more petition signatures to make that ballot, but we will see. Okay, so there's five candidates vying uh, at this convention to get 20% uh, of, the, of the support in order to get on the ballot period unless they have those signatures, and Ron Ketty says he does. We'll, we'll believe him. Uh, so we probably have four candidates uh, and Maharg is a question mark in terms of getting onto the final ballot. She can obviously go get those signatures or uh, in, and figure it out that way. So is that your understanding? Either four or five candidates for governor uh, come June? Yeah, I'm thinking okay. probably four or five unless she gets enough signatures. And then for lieutenant governor, uh, one candidate made it, Ant Thornton. He is uh, from Sandia Park. He's a rocket scientist. So he did seem like he's a very qualified candidate. And so he's the one who made 
the ballot for lieutenant governor. Now, uh, no other candidates did in that race, but there could be other people trying to get those signatures. I know that Peggy Muller Aragon, she uh, announced that she would be going to get extra signatures to get on the ballot. So I'm guessing it'll probably be two, if not three or four, that go in that lieutenant governor as well. Yeah, and uh, I don't want to uh, miss out on anybody. I know that Anise Golden Morper is on that, and she's out of Santa Fe, as I recall. Um, then there's uh, uh, Solis uh, from Las Cruces, Isabella Solis. Yeah. Um, am I missing anybody on the lieutenant governor? Um, I believe uh, Pat Lyons. Oh, Pat also. Lyons, right, the former land commissioner. So, yeah. okay, well, uh, that's kind of uh, the contour of where things are shaping up on some of those races. And I definitely want to talk a little, little bit about, um, you know, congressional and other uh, important races uh, around the state uh, a little bit later on. But uh, talk about uh, what happens down in there. And uh, I know that from news reports, there was a very large crowd. Uh, you've probably been to several of these events in the past. How would you compare and contrast it just in terms of kind of the crowd and the enthusiasm of the crowd? From previous years, I think uh -huh. this is probably the most I've ever seen at a Republican Party uh, primary pre-primary convention, which is great for our party. It shows that we are strong. It shows that we are really unified to come November, take away the radical leftist bent that we have installed in the state through Governor Grisham. And I think this is going to be a reckoning for all those bread lines that we were forced to stand in, all the crazy radicalism that she ran through the legislature, like the Energy Transition Act, like abortion up to birth and infanticide. And I think this November is going to be a big year for all of us because everything is on the line. And I think that's what Republicans saw going into this convention, that we are fired up. There's more people than ever joining our party, and we are ready to take back our state. And I think that's really the message that we got at this convention. Yeah, uh, I, I know folks were fired up. Now, uh, there was some talk of uh, voting troubles. And uh, can you describe the uh, process that was undertaken and what kind of had to happen midstream um, in terms of uh, of the process. I, I'm not saying that everybody that I've talked to down there uh, had concerns, but certainly, uh, you know, media reports and some candidates uh, were kind of less than less than thrilled at the way the process was handled. Yeah, it did get kind of chaotic there for a while. Uh, I believe at the beginning they had a online voting system and due to a malfunction the party says they were not able to get that up and running. I think it was something to do with the congressional districts because they were recently redistricted. So people were in different districts, which made it difficult to put them in the right category to get the correct ballots. So I believe that's the issue that they really had, the little hiccup they had. So what they did is after a while of saying, oh, we're doing the technical difficulties, then they said, we will be switching to paper ballots. And in the audience, a lot of people started clapping because, you know, conservatives, there, there is a big stigma, especially right now with election fraud happening across the country. And so I think that was a good omen that everyone started doing the paper ballots. So after they announced that, there was three different doors and people just lined up at each door that they were, which was each congressional district. So I was in the second, there was the first and the third. So people lined up at the doors and people went two by two outside the doors into another room where you filled out your paper ballot secretly and then you put it in a box and then you left the room and then it just happened in a cycle. So it took a little longer to get that done. And I believe it was very late in the night, about nine, 10 o'clock when they finally finished counting those ballots. But in the next morning, they announced the, the winners of the ballot count, and it was highly supervised. They had uh, poll challengers there, and they also had party officials overseeing the process. So we can ensure that this was done correctly, and uh, especially from my party chair uh, in Otero County, Amy Barella, she uh, was there watching, and she did ensure that it was correctly counted. So I believe that there is integrity in our elections, at least in the Republican Party's one. So I think we can all be proud of the, the final results that we got. Okay, well, that's good to know. Yeah, I, um, I'm glad to hear that 
at least you think the process was uh, ultimately fair and uh, and worked out. So in addition to making the ballot, I know that uh, uh, the voting outcomes for governor and I believe for all the other races also determines position on the ballot, which <clears throat> I don't know how big of a deal that is, but uh, it certainly uh, is a point of pride for candidates that they have the support uh, necessary to be the number one candidate in position on the ballot, but uh, don't know how much that actually impacts outcomes. So uh, let's talk about uh, congressional races, because as you mentioned, there's been redistricting and uh, southeast New Mexico, especially a little, a little further south and east has uh, been split up. But, uh, you know, I don't want to dwell too much on the process and where, where things stand. We kind of know where that uh, that situation is. But in terms of candidates for Congress uh, on the Republican side, uh, I have uh, three Republicans, uh, Garcia Holmes, Jacqueline Reeve, and Luis Sanchez uh, in, in Congressional District 1. Of course, Yvette Harrell running in the 2nd Congressional District. Uh, you're down in Alamogordo, and so is she. She's from there. And then Alexis Martinez-Johnson and Steve McFall running in District 3 against Teresa Legere Fernandez. So uh, all I'm sure all of those candidates were, were down there. Any... Uh, any impressions, any thoughts on uh, how things lined up with, uh, with the various candidates running? So it seems like we have very strong candidates that made the ballot. From what I heard during the convention, it seemed like Louis Sanchez and Michelle Garcia Holmes, both who made the ballot in the first district, are both very strong candidates. It seems like Louis Sanchez has a lot of support. Uh, it, I believe Whip Montoya, Rod Montoya, he's the one who introduced him at the convention, and that got a lot of applause as well. And Sanchez talked a lot about his bucking of these mandates from the governor because he owns Calibers, uh, the shooting range and gun store in Albuquerque. So that really got a lot, a lot of applause. And I think that he has a very good shot of taking this district back from Melanie Stansberry. And then in the second district, Yvette Harrell had a very good speech. She really fired up the crowd, talked about all the hard work that she and Republicans are doing in Congress right now and uh, talking about the future of our state. And then in the third district, uh, we had uh, Alexis Martinez Johnson, who formerly ran in the same district. And I believe she performed, she outperformed previous Republican nominees in that district. And she made the ballot. So she will be the only one on the ballot unless Steve McFall gets enough signatures. But it appears that we have very strong candidates running in all three congressional districts. And this actually, during the redistricting process, they weakened many of these Democrats' strongholds. So due to their, I guess I have to be careful in how I say this, but mm -hmm. quest for power, uh, they kind of messed up their own game potentially because we could have three Republicans representing New Mexico in Congress come 2023 if everything goes our way during this next election. Now, uh, you know, kind of digging in a little bit into these congressional districts, uh, there was some concern that uh, with really each of these districts touching into the Albuquerque area population centers that uh, candidates would be heavily drawn from Albuquerque, at least in this particular race with the Republican candidates, that doesn't seem to be the case. And I, you know, I just want to clarify what you said at the top of the discussion, which is you're from Alamogordo. So you're, uh, you see New Mexico politics to an extent as somebody living in one of these non Albuquerque areas of the state. So you have Albuquerque, uh, you know, Michelle Garcia Holmes and, uh, Luis Sanchez, uh, where do you know Jacqueline Reeve? Where she's from uh, in CD one? I believe she's from Albuquerque, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Yeah. Right. She's new to me, uh, but <clears throat> I guess that's the Albuquerque scene. And then Yvette from uh, Almagordo, and then Martinez Johnson uh, from Santa Fe. So uh, you do have some diversity there, and I, I think that's a healthy thing for everybody in New Mexico. That you don't. Uh, I, I think it would be unfortunate. Uh, and an indictment of the Democrats' uh, redistricting plan if you have three uh, districts in New Mexico all represented by Albuquerque area uh, members of Congress. Yeah, and I think that would be a disservice, in my opinion, having three members of Congress from one state that's very vast. We have hundreds and hundreds of miles separating everybody. 
And having all three from a metropolitan area in northern New Mexico, I don't think that would be ideal. But I think that we got a lot of candidates from many different places geographically in the state. And I think that Martinez Johnson, for instance, I think she has roots down in Roswell as well. And that's where her congressional district now snakes all the way down the state. So I think that we will have candidates who have varied backgrounds and who can connect with the constituents in those various different places in the state due to these redistricting processes. Yeah, now, uh, I guess uh, as something of a media outlet and also a political activist, Will you be engaged with the Democratic Party's convention uh, covering that in any way? Will they let you in the door? How how does that work? That's a good question. I still have to email them for credentials. I'm not too keen on actually being there uh, as I don't think it would be ideal. I don't even think they'll probably let me in the door because quite frankly, whenever I send an email to the governor's office, for instance, I have not got a response once. So I highly doubt that they're gonna let me okay. into their convention to cover it. But I, I do hear that there will be some activists that are gonna be counter protesting the convention, some conservatives who are gonna protest in Roswell. So I think it's going to be very good to see what happens coming out of there. And the Democrats were very, very quick to say, oh, the Republicans had a train wreck of a convention, which was obviously not the case. But I would just love to see what happens during their convention. And I believe that their party has shifted far to the left, and we will see a lot of very far left candidates come out of that convention. I believe it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, most of them are already predetermined. I mean, the, the Democrats do control uh, most of those uh, seats around New Mexico. But since you are in District 2, uh, I figured I would ask you about that particular race. Obviously, the district's changed uh, a lot. It's uh, now uh, much more uh, you know, of a swing seat, even slightly Democrat favored. Uh, I, as I see it on my politics1.com website, uh, the two candidates running on the Democrat side are Darshan Patel and Gabe Vasquez. Now, Vasquez has to be considered the favorite. When I clicked on Darshan Patel, listed as a physician and, and ex-teacher, it went to a LinkedIn page I couldn't even get to. So I, I assume Gabe Vasquez, who's a Las Cruces city councilor, uh, he's going to be the Democrat candidate to take on Yvette Harrell. Any, uh, any uh, thoughts on him? I don't know how well you know him or know of him. Yeah, so when he announced, I did some research on who he is as a person. I've seen him previously on social media talking, but he is very far to the left. He believes that the United States is a white, nationalist, racist nation. So just starting off there, he's not going to be the greatest asset we have in Congress if he gets elected. He is very pro-illegal immigration, very anti-gun, and he has done a lot of very left-wing things on the extremely left-leaning uh, city council of Las Cruces. So if we elect Yvette Harrell, which we did, and it's Yvette versus Gabe Vasquez, I think that it's going to be a tough race, but I think Yvette has a very good shot of getting another term because of Vasquez's extreme left-wing bent that is not going to fly with a lot of these very moderate Democrats that are still in New Mexico who do not want to be part of a very far left agenda that's happening across the country. And especially with this candidate, he is the favorite to win this race. I've never heard of this Patel gentleman, but I believe that Vasquez, he is raising a lot of money and we can see what's going to go on with him in this next election. So, you know, just keep an eye out on that race. It's going to be a very hot ticket race and there's going to be a lot of money from out of state being pushed to try to unseat Yvette Harrell. But I believe that Yvette has a very strong campaign, a very good team. And I believe that that's going to be hard fought, but I believe Yvette should prevail with the right message. All right, and uh, I would be remiss if we didn't uh, discuss some of the other races. Uh, this is a year in addition to governor and lieutenant governor that we have secretary of state, attorney general, auditor, uh, treasurer. Those are, uh, you know, I, I would say that obviously the important ones, and, you know, we're going to talk about what happened during the uh, session on some of these voter bills, but secretary of state and attorney general are the two that really uh, have day-to-day -day big impacts, and you want to have good, solid candidates uh, in those races. Uh, Audrey Trujillo uh, is running 
uh, for Secretary of State, and Jeremy Gay, uh, he's listed as an attorney and U.S. Mil uh, Marine Corps veteran running for Attorney General, although he doesn't have a website set up yet. Um, I'm assuming both of those candidates were in uh, Rio Doso, and uh, you got to meet or at least uh, hear them speak. Any uh, any thoughts on both of those folks? Yes, so Audrey Trujillo, she was there. She gave a very quick speech. It was very good, and I think she has a lot of support behind her. She got a lot of applause, and people know her because she's done a lot of rallies and freedom, freedom protests across the state, and so I think she's a very strong candidate just in that regard. She's actually shown up, she's been there, and she has fought against this radical left-wing agenda, including I've seen her testifying at the legislature against the crazy radical election fraud bills that the governor and the Democrats have proposed. So I think she has been there, she's worked hard, and I believe that she is a very strong candidate. Uh, Jeremy Gay, I don't believe he was at the convention, but I believe he will be a strong candidate from what I hear, his background of service in our nation's military, and then his knowledge from being an attorney himself, he can be very strong against whoever they nominate on the Democrat side, who is either Brian Colon or Raul Torres, two very far left uh, wing politicians. So I think that if we can talk about the issues that matter to us, making sure that our justice system is very quickly expedited so that we can get justice for families that need it. I think that's really going to be what's key in that race. Yeah, and we've, uh, at the Rio Grande Foundation, fought some battles and been frustrated with Hector Balderas uh, and his lack of action on what we see as important crime issues and other uh, issues around our state. And then he instead gets involved in things like uh, I recently wrote about him it, getting New Mexico as a state on an amicus brief, a friend of the court brief, with Berkeley, California, which is trying to ban natural gas hookups in new construction buildings. Uh, he has the time and inclination to uh, jump on board with a uh, radical left-wing uh, town like Berkeley, California, which is uh, trying to you know, go down the path of very, very uh, left-wing policy that also would happen to hurt New Mexico because we're a big producer of natural gas. Uh, you know, that's what Balderas is spending his time doing, but I have heard uh, more than one person say that you know, Raul Torres, and it, it's no secret that he is uh, uh, a project of George Soros. Uh, you know, I'm not going to say George Soros is hiding be every hi behind every tree and bush, but uh, Raul Torres is definitely a, a Soros acolyte uh, having him in the attorney general's office would be an extremely dangerous proposition. I'll, I'll say that very clearly. Yeah, you're right. He has a lot of money behind him from George Soros. And we all know, unless, well, those who don't know George Soros is very radical left wing individual billionaire who has donated to just about every far left cause around including in our state with many dark money organizations. And those organizations have been working overtime, at least at the legislature and across the state, working to enshrine left-wing policies that would hurt New Mexicans, that would tax us even more, and would really make working families the brunt of every single policy that's enacted. So if we put Raul Torres in that position as attorney general, I cannot imagine the havoc and the pain that New Mexicans will have to go through because going under the current attorney general, under Balderas, we have seen what far left policies will do to New Mexico. Imagine someone who's not only a radical leftist, but a radical leftist activist who is funded by a billionaire who has unlimited resources to do whatever it takes to ram far left policies down our throats through the attorney general's office, which is supposed to be the chief law enforcer of the state. Imagine the crazy that is going to go on with that. So in my opinion, he would be the worst, but Brian Colon, he is a far leftist and he has been peddling that same bandwagon of crazy left-wing extremism. So we have to watch out for both these candidates, which is why we need to get behind this Jeremy Gay. At least Republicans must. Got it. All right. Well, let's talk about the session and thank you for your insights and information. It's very helpful as we head into June and then ultimately November, it's good to have people like yourself really uh, uh, kicking the tires, so to speak, uh, on these candidates and uh, 
trying to see what their strengths and weaknesses are and uh, how they're going to hopefully contribute to uh, bringing uh, a little balance next uh, back to New Mexico. But uh, let's talk about the session uh, and especially, you know, you, you know, Pinion Post is a uh, activist site and you're an activist in addition to being a political commentator. Uh, and you definitely got engaged and active on some legislation, uh, specifically dealing with voting rights, but other issues as well. Uh, can you talk about the the voting rights and uh, voting debates? I don't want to call it voting rights. It's uh, the, the election fraud bills, essentially, that were uh, considered during the uh, the recently completed session. Yeah, so the, the Democrats, they put forward Senate Bill 8, which was the very radical bill that would allow for ballot drop boxes in every single county, multiple of them. So that would allow for ballot stuffing. And it also would enable ballot harvesting to ensure that, you know, this ballot harvesting, if people don't know what that is, it's essentially people going door to door or to different people and asking them to get their ballot so that they can deliver it for them and taking their ballot. And through that process, it's a hard chain of custody from where that ballot comes from to where it's placed. And what happens in between? Is that ballot altered? Is it changed? Is there is there some that are thrown out, for instance? So ballot harvesting is a huge issue in New Mexico, and this bill would enable that. As well, it would have allowed felons to vote. It would allow 16-year-olds to vote in municipal elections, as well as multiple other extreme things like allowing third parties to go in the back end of the Secretary of State's website and have a back channel access to the voter file to change voter records of New Mexicans. And so this would really harm people's security of their ballots and their information, as well as make sure that we become the Wild West of voter fraud. And so this bill, it kind of stalled in the Senate, Senate Bill 8. But a previous bill that was just about election, I think it was about Making so, really felonies. quick, uh, wasn't SB8 also the one that um, originally, and it went through many iterations, but it also had, and I, you may have said this, but uh, that you could have mail-in votes, mail-in ballots collected and uh, counted as late as the Friday after the election. Uh, yeah. was, was, that was in that bill, as I recall, the original iteration. It was, you're right. Yeah. Okay. And so, you know, we could potentially change the outcome of an election by you know, putting a ballot on election day and it gets there by Thursday, boom, you know, I just changed an election mm -hmm. result <laughs> by right. putting an absentee ballot. So you're right. It would have been very harmful. And that wasn't the first bill. You're right. Yeah. And, and, then, and uh, it, it could also have generated, you know, opportunities for mischief as votes are still coming in and you kind of manipulate that process. So uh, a lot of problems there. So uh, go ahead and continue. Sorry. Oh, no, you're fine. Yeah, that's a good point to keep on talking about, especially with what they did with the next bill, which was Senate Bill 144, which is just about making a felony of intimidating election judges, I believe. It was a two page bill. And uh, two days before the end of the legislative session, the Democrats in the Judiciary Committee decided that they wanted to amend that two page bill with 165 pages of text that would add all of those bad provisions that were in Senate Bill 8, as well as another bill, Senate Bill 6, and it would add all these horrible provisions into this extreme 165 page bill that was previously just passed by two pages. So this bill that was not very controversial became extremely controversial. And so they rammed that bill through that Judiciary Committee with only 30 minutes of testimony from each side and then after that, it went to the House floor. It was rammed through after three hours of debate, and then it was put to the Senate side. But praise the Lord that we had Senator William Scherer from Farmington in San Juan County. He filibustered during those last few hours of the legislative session, and we killed that extreme pro-voter fraud bill. And that would have enshrined the Wild West of voter fraud in New Mexico. It would have been one of the Hurt, most hurtful bills around. And so we are so blessed to not have that enshrined in law because of one very strong senator who said no way and he filibustered it and it died. Yeah, and just to also be clear, this uh, was a top priority of the governor. 
Uh, Maggie Toulouse Oliver, the current Secretary of State, was engaged at every step of the process in supporting these bills. So it gets back to uh, needing to engage in some of these statewide uh, races and make sure you know and uh, support the, the candidates who are uh, pushing back against these kinds of policies. You're right. Yeah. And especially the other priorities that they had during that legislative session these were other priorities of the governor, such as her hydrogen hub bill that died immediately when it got onto the, I think it was one of the House committees, and then it got revived in a dummy bill in Senate, I think it was House Bill 227 that it got revived in. And then it died again by a vote of no confidence, essentially, in that committee. So we saw that that other proposal died. And then she had a bunch of anti-gun bills. There was House Bill 9 which would force you to buy a lockbox for your firearm unless you don't, and then you become a felon. And then there was another bill, I believe it was House Bill 146, I believe, or I'm sorry, 156, and that was a magazine ban. So a high capacity magazine, what they claim is 15 rounds, that would become illegal, anything post 15 rounds. So pretty much everyone in New Mexico who owns more than 15 rounds in a magazine is a felon if that bill would have passed. And that died as well because a lot of Democrats actually rejected it as well. And then uh, we had House Joint Resolution 2, which was a radical enviro-Marxist constitutional amendment, which would give a constitutional right to clean and healthy air, water, soil, and environment, as well as a stable climate. Now, these very weirdly vague words were intentionally written so that people could just sue based on feelings, essentially, because if someone feels like they don't have the right climate in New Mexico, then let's just go suing the state and municipalities because my, the climate's too hot today, you know? <laughs> right. So, yeah. And that was what, the second year in a row that we killed that. Yeah, what, what clean means is uh, very open to interpretation, I think, by... Uh, any reasonable standard, we are living in the time of the cleanest environment that we've ever had, and uh, certainly modern human history. Uh, you can maybe argue about hunters and gatherers who lived to 30, but uh, certainly in recent memory, uh, we're doing quite well. And yeah, there, there's a lot of bills and a lot of things that I know you worked on and we worked on at the Rio Grande Foundation, and uh, of course, SB 14, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that one, the clean fuel standard gas tax increase or gas price increase. Uh, and then that was uh, also added in with the, the the last second attempt to keep the San Juan generating station open. And that one failed on a tie vote on the House floor in the waning hours of the session as well. So uh, I assume you uh, share my general belief that it could have been a heck of a lot worse this particular legislative session and the activists uh, that showed up and uh, got on zoom and talked in committee hearings uh, made a big difference and uh, and it, it you know we'll see where things take us in this election but uh, it was a it was a uh, good or at least a uh, helpful uh, session to kind of unify people fighting against these bad policies and hopefully moving good policy forward in the not too distant future. I agree with you. I think I would be, I would dare to say that we had a successful legislative session by all the things that we killed by the people working hard alongside you and your group, as well as my organization, working hard to get the message out to people. And what I've done through the opinion post is really try to open up the legislative session to the people because Usually people think, oh, you know, waiting around the Capitol to go into a committee hearing room to talk about X or Y, you know, mostly lobbyists are the ones who testify on bills usually. And so this legislative session, as well as last, we worked hard to start bringing the people back into the conversation because every single bill that would have passed is going to affect us. No matter if we like it or not, it's going to affect us. And we made a lot of strides here. We send out tens of thousands of emails. And through the process of even going on Zoom, we heard the voices of New Mexicans actually talking about the issues they cared about and where they're coming from if these bills would have passed and what it would have meant 
for their communities and for their families. So this was a very successful legislative session, except for a few bills, such as the governor's $8.5 billion budget that put free college into effect that gave us $10 million for enviro Marxism and $300,000 to hire an anti-gun activist to learn how to take away our guns. That was one defeat that we did have, as well as the free college bill. And other than that, there were a couple good bills that were bipartisan, such as a cut to the gross receipts tax and the social security, even though the social security only caps it at 100,000 and the gross receipts tax is 0.5%, I believe, cut, which is nothing, it's peanuts, but it's something. So I think that the strides that we made this session were good. And I think that this momentum we have is gonna help us coming to the next election and beyond. No, I, I agree with you. And yeah, that, uh, that budget bloat and the amount of spending that went on, uh, it, it makes it hard for me to say it was a successful session, but it definitely was a lot better, uh, you know, in terms of where it went at the end of it than it was uh, when I thought where we were starting out at. Uh, I, I thought, really, this is going to be a tough session. So uh, we're going to have to wrap it up uh, uh, pretty quickly here. But, uh, John, I appreciate your time, and uh, I know people can find you at the Pinion Post, but anything else you want to relay to folks as we do wrap things up. Yeah, so pretty much I just want to say thank you to all those people who helped us this last legislative session to get the word out and to keep the fight up because I know it's hard to follow all these things and it's hard to put your time and your effort into these things to fight for our state, but we did make very big victories this last legislative session in a very left-wing left -wing legislature. So I am just so grateful for all those people. And uh, you can continue your activism by following the Pinion Post. We're on all the social media sites. We'll be on Truth Social when Trump lets us in. And uh, all we are is at Pinion Post. And you'll find us on pinionpost.com to read all of our news every single day. And we send out weekly newsletters. We send one every Tuesday morning. So look out for those and sign up if you haven't already signed up. And please follow us on all social media so that you can keep informed on what's happening in our state and keep on forward, especially through what the Rio Grande Foundation is doing in other places around the state. We appreciate all those groups. And uh, we did a lot of good work and we looked forward to doing more. So thank you. Thanks, John. And uh, just to be clear, P-I-N-O-N-P-O-S-T dot com. You don't have to go finding an Inye button uh, for that in, uh, although that is uh, definitely part of your name, but uh, uh, you is. can just go uh, P-I-N-O-N-P-O-S-T uh, dot com. And, all right. Well, thanks for all you're doing to help turn New Mexico around, John, and we look forward to working with you as uh, uh, June and then November approach. Uh, Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Find all episodes at tippingpointnm.com or at the Rio Grande Foundation's YouTube and Rumble channels. Subscribe to this show at Apple, Stitcher, or have your Google Home play Tipping Point New Mexico. Thanks to Path3 Marketing for producing this show.